And now for the last part, part four of the population growth, population ecology. So hopefully you all know that the human population is growing and gro growing quite alarmingly. And so population ecologists look at the question of how sustainable is this growth? How long can the human population keep growing until we start to suffer some consequences for it? And so we're going to look at uh, population shifts over time and how population ecologists study them. <clears throat> and one thing that they will use are age pyramids. And these age pyramids, which kind of look like sideways bar graphs, um, reveal a lot about how a population is growing. And we can track through them things like baby booms. You've probably heard of the baby boomers, people born in the late 50s to early 60s that are now at or just past retirement age. And you hear about problems associated with health care, problems associated with um, payout of Social Security uh, because the young people putting in now are not as plentiful as the older people getting ready to retire. And so for a, a few years we're going to have a bit of a stagnation while we wait for the government to figure out what exactly they're going to do to handle the retirement of such a large cohort of people. And of course, baby booms occur periodically, and when they do, we need to increase the size and the number of schools. And as they pass through after 15 years or so, then we need to decrease the number. And same thing, each time they progress in age as a cohort, we find that there's a uh, a lowering number of job availabilities and then there's a glut of jobs as they pass through into retirement and a tremendous number of new positions are open. And so as we look at examples of each type of potential population growth, notice that for each type of growth we have five-year cohorts. So for people aged 0 to 4, people aged 5 to 9, and ecologists will study how that group, that cohort of five-year birth rate people matriculate through the society and what you can predict is likely to happen as a result. So you see in the rapid growth areas, this would be the first transition, um, or we would generally refer to these as third world countries, we have a very high birth rate, we have a large number of people being born each year, so we have relatively large numbers in the lower aged cohorts. But there's a high death rate, and so we have a low percentage of the population or a small number of people in the very advanced years. And so you get this uh, kind of point up triangle with a wide base. Then as medical conditions improve, as healthcare improves, as sanitation improves, we get slowing growth. We get people living to a longer age because of all these health benefits, but we don't necessarily have a decrease in birth rates. And that's typified of currently the United States, and we would look at that as generally a second stage or a second world country. And then we look at the negative growth rate where you have sort of a, a blocky rectangle with a smaller base than a top, or sometimes the base and the top are both smaller with a broad middle range. And what this is showing is that you have a declining death rate, so you have a larger number of people living into advanced years, but you also have a declining birth rate and hence the narrow base, and this would be generally considered first world country or a third level of transition. So as you look at two basic populations, we have an example here of Norway from 2007, and you can see how blocky and rectangular it is and how narrow the top is. This is because we have a significant but smaller number of people in the very advanced years, and yet in Kenya we have a tremendous base, a huge birth rate, and a very narrow top showing that we have people living for a longer, a few people living for a long time, but not enough 
to widen out the top of that pyramid. Now another important thing to notice here is that the units are different. So we have what look like large numbers in Norway, we go up to 200, whereas in Kenya we only go up to 3.5. But if you notice at the base, in Norway you're only looking at hundreds of thousands of people, while in Kenya you're looking at millions of people. So they have better than 6 million births per year in Kenya, whereas you're looking at only around 250,000 births per year in Norway. And so extreme differences between the first world and third world countries. And I mentioned the baby boomers before, and so we can kind of see the glut in the population at back in, in 2007 in the 45 to 65 or 64 year olds, which of course now they're roughly 10 years older than that. And so they, you kind of get this population surge at that as that age cohort of 20 years or so keeps progressing through. So we have a smaller number of people being born than people at that age who will in the next few years be retiring. So take a look at the question and when you're ready, uh, pause the video and then when you're, once you've answered it, advance it. And so hopefully you realized that Kenya would have the largest amount of the population below age 10. That would be the, the lower two of the age cohorts. And so again, we look at mathematically a graph of what is happening at each of these demographic transitions. In the first transition, so again, these would be the third world countries. We have birth rate in green and death rate in red. And the population growth bounded by the uh, kind of bell curve there in blue. So in the first world populations, we have a very high birth rate initially and a fairly high death rate as well. But birth rate is a little bit higher than death rate and so we have a growing population. Then we have a fast growing population in the second world countries or the second transition because we still have a very high birth rate, but because of improvements in access to health, access to sanitation, and improved medical care, we have a decrease in the death rate. So people live longer, but the access to potentially education, contraception is not there, and so we still have a very high birth rate. And this leads to a very fast population growth. And then finally, you get the third level of transition or the first world countries. And as education, access to contraception catches up with the increased medical conditions and increased sanitation, we have now a lowering of the birth rate. And this will lead to either no growth or negative growth. In other words, a population decrease. And that's what you saw in, in Norway, or sorry, in, uh, in Italy. And so if we look at what the population pyramids look like for this first and second world country, we see the vast differences in the population growth. Whereas in Sweden, oops, sorry, in Sweden we get an actual inverted triangle where the base is narrow and the top is wide. And in Mexico we get a very blocky rectangular uh, population pyramid because we have such large numbers of births, but not a high, uh, not large rate of high rate of death. So again, pause it, and once you've answered, then advance the slide. And hopefully, you realize that at point B, the birth rate, the green line, is still quite high, but the death rate has decreased. C is still in that second phase of transition or the second world countries, but if you notice the green line, the birth rate has decreased, so it's not at its maximum. And again, kind of why do we care? Well, because a population, human population, is growing extremely fast. We now have better than 7 billion people on the planet, and if you notice for most of the human population, we've had fewer than a billion people, and it's only been in the last 
thousand years or so that this has increased and really only in the last 10 years that it's increased as rapidly into such a high level and so we get both the uh, the stylized version which shows the different ages on the left and a, an economic cartoon on the right showing gosh you know I hope that we can keep this going have enough food supplies enough access to all people to be able to sustain those populations and currently we have well very few things that we do to try to curb population and what we've been doing instead is looking to increase the carrying capacity or increase the amount of people the volume of population that the planet can sustain and we've done that primarily in three different ways by expanding into new habitats so Vegas would be an example of that Vegas is in a legitimate desert fewer than 10 inches of rain a year and yet we have a thriving city this is because of how we've been able to import goods and to improve um, irrigation to have things like grass and trees growing where ordinarily you would not we've been able to increase agricultural productivity with less land available and accessible for agriculture we're actually producing more food now than at any point in history and we're able to live at a higher density so we with the advent first of skyscrapers and now of super skyscrapers we're able to have millions to tens of millions of people living in fairly small areas like major cities such as New York City, Singapore, Hong Kong but how high can this go? It's eventually going to reach a point where we can no longer increase food production we can no longer access formerly inhospitable lands and there are only so many people you can cram into a limited area before things like sickness begin to spread and you can evaluate kind of how you're doing at, at an individual level uh, with one of the footprint calculators so it looks at for a person living just in a generalized average in the world versus somebody living in the United States how your use of fuel water um, higher resource foods like meats um, are or how you are using these uh, and so it's, it's kind of eye-opening to see uh, well kind of how wasteful we are in the United States